Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alex Farber, Deputy Editor of Broadcast Magazine. Thank you for joining us for this MPTS session, Getting Natural History Back on Track. So, the purposes of the next 30 minutes is to get a sense of the way in which the pandemic and lockdown has affected natural history and hear about some of the new ways of working that have emerged as a result. I'll introduce our panel in a moment, but before I do, if you have any questions you would like to ask, please do enter them in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen and we will make time to ask as many, answer as many as we can towards the end of the session. So, on to our panel. George Paniotu is Business Development Director for Films at 59. They've worked across BBC One's recent Perfect Planet and Apple TV's Earth at Night in Colour. Helena Berglund is Head of Production for True to Nature. Her business is backed by Sky Studios and is responsible for Dave's Expedition with Steve Backshall and forthcoming Sky Nature series Sharks with Steve Backshall, Gangs of Macaque Island and Dreamflight. And finally, Lucy Bilson is Deputy Head of Production for Plimsoll Productions. Their projects include Netflix's Night on Earth and Apple's Tiny World. So, you guys have all clearly have some significant shows under your belts. Um, but I wonder if you could give us an idea of the way in which lockdown has impacted any project that are currently in production. Um, Helena, I might come to you first, see if you can give us a sense of the way in which things have uh, affected your business. Yeah, so we were um, actually going into production with Expedition Series 2 in March when the pandemic hit. Um, and it meant that we had to put that um, production on hold for, I think, three or four months over the summer. Um, sort of conversely, or oddly, actually, it ended up being um, a kind of benefit, it sort of benefit to us in that we were able to get um, Expeditions Unpacked, which was a kind of... Um, sort of brand extension of expeditions commissioned and the team were able to stay on um, with us over the summer and produce that for us delivering in July and we um, with the help of the government scheme the government restart scheme we started production again in August and undertook our first expedition in September um, I mean obviously expeditions in the nature very nature of what we're doing going to places nobody's ever been before working in a really remote way and often um, kind of high risk uh, activities, you know, that was no sort of mean feat really attempting that in, in September, we went to Russia in Kamchatka. Um, but we were able to do it. I think it was um, a huge learning curve actually as our first shoot out in terms of working in constant uncertainty. And I think that's kind of one of the, the real takeaways from us from that first shoot um, in that we kind of needed to have a plan A, plan B and plan C kind of running almost all at the same time. But it went well and we um, continued with our second expedition in December to Saudi Arabia and we're just back from our third in Gabon due to go out on our fourth in April should things remain as they are. But obviously, as we know, you know, um, rules and guidelines are changing for every location all the time. So it's an ever changing situation, really. And I think, um, you know, the teams have had to get really comfortable with a very sort of high level of uncertainty. And I think that's that's been sort of one of the biggest impacts on the production process for us. Yeah, and, and I mean, logistically, you've had people flying all over the world. I mean, yes. that must have yes. its own problems. Um, yes, it has. I mean, we work with um, a company called Secret Compass on the health and safety side of things. So there's a very rigorous kind of COVID protocol process that we go through prior to production and during production. I mean, we spent a lot of time looking at the safety of flying. And ultimately, I think, um, there are ways in which you can mitigate those risks. Usually when you're on set, whether that's outside or in a studio, it's probably the safest place you're gonna be that day. I think the risks um, with COVID to production are really what happen, you know, in transit or in the evenings, you know, mm. when people perhaps relax a little bit. So I think it's just having to be sort of kind of on the ball with the COVID side of things 24 hours a day when you're away on location, which is tough on the teams. Yeah. At least this going your experiences. Um, you were saying you haven't had any productions cancelled, but you've had a few things delayed. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so I'm um, very similar uh, similar experience to Helena, but ours has more been in the sense of we haven't had to actually down tools for a period of time. We've managed to keep going, whether it be remote shoots, which are obviously shoots with local camera operators where we're not sending any of our crew into the field anymore, 
Um, however, there are obviously some shoots that have had to be delayed and the obviously natural history world, a lot of the animal behavior is seasonal. So if we, so say when COVID hit last spring, we had lots of shoots that had to move to the following spring because we weren't able to actually, that was that horrid time where no one knew what was going on. There were no protocols in place. Everyone was kind of like, uh, what do we do? Um, so we had to delay a lot of those shoots to the following year, which as you can imagine, has a massive uh, effect on the schedule and obviously the budget, because obviously we have to cope with that extension to, um, you know, of all the staff, of, of, of kind of everyone on the production. So whilst we have been able to continue, we have had to move shoots, which has had an impact obviously on the schedule and the budget. Um, and, and like with, um, as Helena mentioned, traveling crew around the world where we have managed to do it has been massively um, a very reactive response to what's going on you can't necessarily be as proactive as you normally would be because rules are constantly changing as we know um, in country a lot of the time they don't actually know themselves what is the final line on on what what you can and can't do sometimes we, we had a shoot um, go out to Norway and we were told that the crew wouldn't know whether they would have to quarantine or not until they arrived and that's how last minute some of the information has been coming through to us or how it's been changing uh, kind of an evolving process so it has been very tricky and I would say it's been particularly tricky for the production managers and production coordinators that have to um, like Helena said have that a plan, B plan, C plan, and often they'll they'll set up a shoot that sometimes won't be able to happen because rules have since changed. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I, I have utter respect for our production managers and PCs that have been coping with this during this period. Yes, yeah, a lot of logistics and mitigating and and and, and second and planning and replanning. Um, and George, is it obviously it's not just people that have been um, moving around the world. It, it's it's kit as well. I mean. How have you found the logistics of, of transporting, you know, some of the gear that's required to these far-flung locations? Yeah, well, the the initial pack impact of uh, lockdown was, um, as you can imagine, you know, crews on location were then, you know, coming back back to base, um, and anything that we had potentially going out was cancelled. So, you know, we had a huge, you know, in the last twenty years, I don't think we've had as much kit. Um, in our buildings at any one time, you know, as I say, we had a you know, kit that was due to go out, um, just cancelled and then crews coming back. So it was the logistics of, you know, coordinating that with the production teams um, and bringing those back back on site. Um, but as we've as we've moved forward and as things started picking up again, you know, and it wasn't really until September, I think, for us that we started seeing things moving. Um, and that wasn't even abroad. I mean, I think we there were a few. We had a few productions that were UK based, and so there, there were some shoots that were sort of happening, probably remotely as well, just because of the restrictions of, of movement around around the UK as well. Um, and like I say, it wasn't really until September and October that we started getting kit prepped for you know for natural history guys to go out. But you know, as as Lucy and Helena have said, you know, last minute changes you know often meant that the shoots were cancelled. So um yeah we were just working very closely with the production teams to you know to make things happen for them really. Um and it's and it's again it, it's managing you know kit coming back if kit, if crews have gone out um to a to a red list country, for example, you know they they come back. We you know have to quarantine the kit for a period of time, make sure it's completely sanitised. You know the handling of that kit is is really key as well. So, yeah, logistics of, of managing that have been uh, have been complex. I, I should say. And what's been the appetite of production teams to travel? I mean, are they grateful to be working in this current climate, or has there been a sort of human aspect, guys, in terms of managing people and helping? reassure them you know to, to be while you're you know asking them to, to effectively travel at a time when you know the government messaging is all around don't travel unless absolutely necessary um I, I can speak for it uh, you know on behalf of the crews that we've been working with i mean generally speaking they've all been kind of desperate to get back out there i think they they take confidence from you know the protocols you know within which we're working and and um, we certainly don't sort of put any pressure on anyone. You know, it's really 
um, if somebody doesn't feel comfortable with doing something, then then you know there's definitely no pressure from us. But we're kind of talking about the health and safety side of things and how we're going to work that um, work that each and every shoot individually as we go. But I think definitely having got a few big ones under our belt in in September and October, it's definitely given us confidence going forward. And I think we're all getting used to working at a very sort of detailed level on the COVID supervisor front. I mean, we we have a COVID supervisor on every single shoot and. Um, I think you know we're looking at potentially having somebody within within the company sort of just looking at the covid logistics for each shoot as well because i think it's it's really as lucy was saying you know doubled the workload of the pcs and the pms and you know there's a real un there's a real hidden cost really i mean things like quarantine and testing you can easily put a price to but what is hard to put a price to is the time and the sort of extra level of detail and work that the teams you know in pre-production production and post-production are having to work through and I think that that's been quite tricky for us mm. yeah and I mean have you found broadcasters to be supportive in terms of you know financially and logistically in terms of helping you while having to incur these additional expenses as a result yeah. of the protocols uh, yeah. that have to be put in place yeah definitely from our perspective the um all the broadcasters and distributors we've been working with have been super supportive so um and you know try to find creative solutions in terms of sort of editorial as well as fine uh, you know the finance side of things um mm. and so far we haven't come to you know to a difficult sticky situation we've always been able to find a way forward um but yeah i have mm. to say that was probably a bit of nervousness at the beginning as how supportive would how supported would we be um but actually i've been really really pleasantly sort of surprised at how supportive they've all been actually is that something that filters down into 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 your area george the kind of um extra expenses is there costs incurred and how how how, how does that conversation who do you have that conversation with well you know from, from a you know more specifically from a you know, from a post-production point of view you know our, our schedules thankfully were pretty busy uh, between march um well sort of the whole of last year you know from you know when lockdown was announced so um as i say you know we we had to get all of our post teams off site, you know, that, and, you know, that's where our, our tech teams came into their own. You know, it was, it was amazing to watch, you know, just how, how, how quickly we got everyone up and running, you know, working remotely. Um, you know, that's our sound guys, our, you know, our, our, our colorists, you know, we had four of our colorists at home with, you know, um, simplified base light setups, you know, for grading, um, and all our online, you know, our online guys were working remotely as well. What, what, complicated it slightly for us was that we were right in the middle of delivering two fairly big hdr series for an s ford so um you know it couldn't have come at a worse time because you know with regards to sign-offs and things like that you know hdr sign-offs and dolby atmos sign-offs can can't really happen remotely so um that was complex and and you know again as helena was saying about broadcasters you know i've got to be thankful to our production class because they quickly got on board with the challenges that we faced you know and, and were very accepting about the restrictions and um and you know about the remote sign-offs and when we finally got back into the buildings you know on a very limited operational basis in in mid-june you know where where you would normally have two or three of the production team you know, execs coming in to sign off you know we were limiting those numbers to to one or two people and uh, and you know that was that was difficult i think it you know it was it was again managing that with our with our production clients and and they were really understanding um and knew knew the challenges that we were all up against um but yeah it was um i mean cost wise you know there were lots of things that we had to put in place we we were doing that as a you know i, I don't think we really charged that on to clients you know as a, as a sort of goodwill we're in this together so let, let's get through it together so um yeah, there were there were a few things that um, you know from an investment point of view, but um, I say it was just it's just the fact of you know the relationship with our with our production clients are, are good, and we uh, we got through it together basically. That's good to hear, Lucy. I thought it was interesting you mentioned earlier the fact that you'd started to or started to you were employing local crews. Um, is that, if I understood you correctly, is that something that you did um, look to do increasingly? Was there any implications of that? Can you give us a sense of the way in which you may have shifted from, you know, trying to mitigate having to send UK staff around the world to working with people that are already on the ground? Yeah, sure. So we, we, you know, 
all of us have done remote shoots in the past. Sometimes, you know, there are just things that crop up where you need to do a remote shoot anyway, pre-COVID. Um, we had one particular production that's still in production now for Netflix, which actually luckily had already had quite a few remote shoots budgeted and that's what they were planning anyway. So the shift for them to do more remote shoots was actually a little bit more of a natural flow for them because they'd already kind of anticipated doing a certain amount of remote shoots before COVID came along. Um, but what we found, there's been a real advantage in the sense that we've got to know a lot more um, talented local camera operators because we've actually had to put the time in to find those people. We're able to obviously hire local people, which helps their economy. Um, and then, I mean, obviously the disadvantage is we all like the producer or director to be on the ground. Um, there is a disadvantage, of course, but we have often found, uh, not in every circumstance, I have to be honest, but but mostly camera operators have really stepped up to the, to the plate in terms of actually getting the brief from the director, staying in touch with them, sending notes in the evening back to them, what's happened in the day. You know, that, that's the job that they would not normally have to do if a producer was on location, obviously, because that communication would be there anyway. Um, so, so whilst we have had some shoots where it's not worked out 100% in terms of the, the particular camera operators, it has generally been okay. Um, and what's really great about it is that it's obviously lowered um, our carbon footprint because obviously with natural history, people are traveling around the world um, to film these amazing stories and being able to use local crew and sometimes kits has enabled us to lower our carbon footprint. So it is definitely something that we will obviously be more um, welcome of um, in the future with regards to new productions. We obviously still will be sending our crews on the ground. Um, we still have been able to do it with some now, um, but we it is definitely a new way of, of looking at it. Is there any, I mean, is it too early to say, what would be an example of an exo an instance when you might be prepared to work not someone, whereas you would like to have a producer director? What, what, is it, it? Can you give us a broad sense of when it might be more appropriate for you to embrace that more fully in future, in a longer term? Embrace remote filming. Yeah, embrace increased amounts of remote filming and local crews rather than sending people overseas. You know, is it a case of certain instances it will be more appropriate than others? Yes, um, it all kind of depends on how complex the production is. How I mean, the challenge with natural history it, nowadays is obviously every series, especially with the blue chip natural history series, the non-presenter led series. We have to find new ways of bringing the the, the nature and the, you know the animals to life. Um, it's all about kind of obviously moving forwards, and and that next series needs to be bigger and better than the previous series. So obviously, with that, it does help to have producer directors on the ground. But there are also series on the flip side where it is your more standard traditional natural history series. We know we've used a local camera operator before. We know that they can provide us with what they need. We know that they can send the notes required to the producer and the director. So we would definitely look at doing that again if it was the right shoot in the right country at the right time, if that makes sense. Yeah, you're nodding, Helena. That's something you recognise as well, is it? It's a kind of, yeah. you know... Yeah, definitely. That I think the the I mean Lucy's pretty much covered covered it all anyway already in terms of the the benefits. I think um, you know it's it's definitely what's been quite interesting is obviously with the budgets you can get slightly more from those budgets when you're not sending an entire team um, with you know abroad. So I think we'll probably look at sort of more hybrid teams going forward. I think there are some exceptional circumstances when we're doing I don't know cave diving or you know, if we're doing a specific expedition that requires specific expertise, um, then we will need to look at taking specialist crews with us. But even on the expeditions, you know, so far, I think we've averaged at least 50-50 from UK crew and then crew or specialist contributors or fixers in country who make part of that expedition team. So, um, yeah, I think it's been a really interesting sort of enlightening oh. road. What would, it been, what would it previously? You say you've gone more even now. Would it previously have been more... 
whole I think, would have been. Yeah, I think it's been a my it's been a sort of mind shift for all the production teams. I mean, everybody tends to want you know the pressure you're under. You you have your go-to people to work with, whether that's camera operators or producers, directors, fixers. But I think this has forced everybody to think slightly differently. And I think, um, you know, coming out the other side of it, everyone can see the benefits and, you know, all kinds of different benefits, just even, you know, with the diversity yeah. targets that we have to hit, that that is actually aided by the fact that we're working with more people in country, all over the world. I mean, yeah, I would say the silver linings probably outweigh the cons so far. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that in terms of opportunities. I mean, I wonder, and I'm kind of jumping off on a question from the audience now, whether, you know, one implication of that might be fewer opportunities for UK-based um, individuals looking to break into or grow their careers in, in natural history. Is that a potential repercussion of a more, uh, you know, remote working practices? Uh, I... I would say currently the demand for natural history content is so high that actually I, I don't see that as a concern. It really depends what happens over the next sort of two to five years. But as we are at the moment, I'm sure Lucy's having the same kind of challenges. You know, I don't think it's a secret that, you know, there are lots of natural history commissions at the moment. So if we weren't actually able to start relying more on local crews and in-country talent, we would have a much bigger issue on our hands. So no, I don't. I don't see it as an issue. I think it's more going down that hybrid team route, really, for us anyway. Yeah, okay. I agree. I actually think there's more opportunity now um, than there was before because with natural history, unlike your dramas or your kind of scripted comedy or studio shoots, we have been able to keep going during COVID and there are quite a lot of productions out there. So it is a good time, still a good time to get into natural history. Mm. Good. That's pleasing to hear. Um, George, just going to open it up a bit to um, yeah. talking about the editing process. And when we're talking about remote working, mm -hmm. um, obviously that doesn't only apply to um, production teams, but there's also a, an impact in terms of the remote editing um, end of things. Can you give mm -hmm. us a sense of, you know, how you've embraced remote editing and the extent to which you think that is going to become more a, um, a, a, a fixture in, yeah. in processes, you know, sure. following, following lockdown concluding? Yeah, so um, so we we moved. I mean, we were running um, probably forty odd cutting rooms at the time. You know, back in March last year, and you know, we uh, we had all of those running remotely um, by sort of mid end of March. And um, and it's interesting because I think you know, talking to editors, um, you know, who have been working remotely, you you get a you get a mixed response. You know, a lot of them, you know, six six months in, were saying, "Oh, we're desperate to." You know, be back in back in films or in a post house so that we can you know interact with other editors you know with production team and stuff like that in person um and others are saying oh this is great because you know we've wanted to work you know part of our part of our um uh edit remotely and it hasn't really been accepted by production so you know, it's probably a question for helena and lucy as well but i think you know I think going forward, I think we will see a mix. I think we'll see the, maybe the early part of edits being remote and um, editors working from home, and then as it comes to more the you know the the storytelling and the structure of the of, of the show, it, that you know that's when they're going to be in the cutting room with their with their director and producer. Um, but I think it's something that we will continue definitely to offer as an option is is remote editing, um, and I think it will be embraced going forward as well post COVID. And from a production, guys, from a production point of view, how comfortable have you been with 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 working remotely on on your edits, um, Lucy and Helena? Uh, I would say, true to nature, we've definitely had a very very mixed response. I mean, some projects um, we've taken offline remotely, and will probably remain remote if they, you know for those recommissions. The teams have loved it. There haven't been any other issues. I think there are other there are slightly bigger projects that have been more challenged in the edit actually, and I think. Um, collectively, both the editors and the producers will probably revel getting back into the edit suite. And, and it's usually um, the first question we get asked, actually, in terms of coming into the office. There seems to be less demand to come back into the office. And I think people enjoy working remotely on, you know, during that part of the production. But I'm definitely getting lots more requests in terms of when can we get back into the edit suite. So I think, George, we, you should... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
Hang on to those expensive central Bristol properties, George. Don't send oh, the computer. No, no, absolutely house. no. Yeah. Well, well, that's good to hear because we have uh, we have invested in more space, as you know, Helene and Lucy. So <laughs> for more cutting rooms, so that's that's good that they're not uh, they're not going to be empty and everyone's working remotely. Now, I, I think I think it's you know it's all about you know that collaborative working, you know that that creative working together. I think at the edit stage is where where that all starts, and I think being being together in a cutting room, you know, um, is really key. But um, but yeah, I, I, I still do believe there will be a, a mix going forward. I think, you know, there will be some remote working requ uh, requests as well as uh, in-house as well. Um, Lucy, I'd like to come back to pick up on a point with you about um, something you raised around delays and the impact on, on, on that. There has been some suggestion that we'll see as production really starts to get back into gear again, there's going to be a bit of um, issues of overcrowding around some of the sort of world's hotspots, if you like. Is that something? Is that something that you recognise, or is there enough space in the uh, in the world, as it were, for everyone to to, to coexist? Yeah, I mean that's a very valid point. So, obviously, we often film at similar locations to or the same locations as other production companies. So whilst certain maybe national parks or other private locations or reserves have been closed we're all going to be want to as you say getting into those locations at the same time um so i mean what's good about the bristol community and the bristol natural history community is we do have um kind of an open um line of communication amongst the um production companies so often myself and helena will sit on um get onto a meeting with other head of productions at other companies and we've often just been discussing the issues that have been faced by covid the challenges of covid obviously this is something we're all going to be eager to get the first spot on that reserve that has been closed for a while so it's not you know there's obviously going to be some sort of um you know who first come first serve but there are ways which we've coped before um pre to covid where where one location might have agreed for said production company to start filming in February, but then they've also agreed at the same time for another production company to start filming the following month, and then have realized that they don't want to cruise on the ground at the same time, obviously due to kind of, you know, keeping nature as it is, that sort of thing. So we have worked out ways in the past, such as shoot shares, they are complicated to do, but that is possible where you kind of obviously both agree a pathway forwards for you both to be able to get what you need from that location during the same period. Um, so we're hopeful that there might be some ways through it with that. Um, but I, I do have to be honest, and I do think it is going to be a kind of first come first serve type thing. But we will obviously, like I say, we do talk to each other, we will keep those lines of communication going. Um, with regards to, you know, someone might have a delivery that can't move. If that's the case, I'm sure people would, you know, be up for discussion about whether they could move their shoot to obviously allow them to go ahead. Mm -hmm. It's a, a collaborative approach, as you've referenced a couple of times. It's a small, close-knit community, and it's making sure that everyone is, um, you know, working together, as it were. Um, I'm just conscious of time, and just, just to wrap things up, I think we've got a, a, a final question from the audience. Just around... You know, it feels like natural history is really enjoying a golden hype period at the moment, not least because of the escapism it, it affords audiences. You know, what is that? What can be done to ensure that that's really capitalised on, or do you think that that will naturally decline over over the over the over the over the months? Um, Helena, what's your take on whether this sort of um, bubble can can continue to expand? Um. Yeah, that is a re it's something we talk a lot a lot about here at Truth, Truth to Nature. But I think um, I think the kind of interest in in the current sort of you know state of the the climate change at the moment was was already kind of that conversation had already started by the time um, COVID hit. I think um, what's been really encouraging from our perspective is having sort of much more detailed conversations with the commissioners and broadcasters about. Um, climate change and, and the message in our program, the messaging in our program, programs. So um, Sky have just launched Planet Test, um, which is kind of just a, you know guidelines that we kind of have to meet in, on the editorial side, and that's that's there's been a huge shift I think in those conversations. So 
that coupled with this pandemic and it having just kind of really affected people on a much more personal level, I think it'd be interesting to see how that drives those narratives forward. Because I think, you know, previous to that, you know, even just a couple of years ago, we were still sort of trying to tell those stories, whereas it feels we're being invited now to tell those stories in ways we haven't before. And I think definitely as a community, you know, in the genre, we're really excited about that. So I hope it lasts. Um, but we, I guess it's time to tell them. Hmm. Right, okay. Well, I think that's covering everything, and I think the session is now drawing to an end. We've got through all the audience questions in our, in our 30 minutes. So, everyone, thank you very much indeed for your time. George, Helen, and Lucy, good luck with the rest of the year and all your productions. Thank and you. thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Thanks very thank much. You. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.